I think it's a great privilege to be able to mentor younger people, especially the women that come through, because quite often the staff that come through are from backgrounds that perhaps um, women aren't empowered and the fact that they can come to work and be given a team leader role or whatever role. And I think that that helps them to gain confidence and grow. Welcome to the VegLog podcast, a dialogue about the Australian vegetable industry from AusVeg, your peak industry body. I'm your host, Tom Bicknell. This is our final episode for 2023, and for a wrap-up on the year and a look ahead to 2024, we'll be speaking with AusVeg's CEO, Michael Coote. We'll also be hearing about some globally leading research presented at the South Australian Onion Growers Lunch in November. Topping it off, we'll hear from Angela Candeloro, winner of the Boomeroo Nurseries Women in Horticulture Award for 2023, about a life growing up on farm and the need for industry veterans to send the ladder back down. So let's go to Ausveg's CEO, Michael Coote, now for a look at where we've been and where we're going. Michael, thanks for joining me. Uh, between extreme weather, big rises in the cost of production, labour shortages and low market prices, 2023 has been a, a very tough year for growers. In the media at the moment, we're seeing a lot of stories talking about the various government investigations into the retail sector. We've just had recommendations come out of the parliamentary inquiry into food security and the independent reviewer of the Food and Grocery Code has released his annual report with some damning data on how growers feel they've been treated by the retailers. Next year, the Senate Select Committee on Supermarket Prices will get underway with a report due in May, and the government's two-year competition review is rolling on. Between the public awareness that's generating and the investigations themselves, do you see much potential for change in 2024? Thanks, Tom. Look, it has been a tough year for growers uh, in 2023. Uh, an Ausveg survey in the middle of the year um, had, a, had an overwhelming response um, from, from the sector and 34% of growers in our sector are considering leaving the industry in the next 12 months. So that, I think, indicates the, the, the real lack of confidence and the, um, the, the, the low sentiment in the sector at the moment. Um, you, you rightly pointed out a number of the, the challenges that are, that are fairly well publicised that the industry is facing. Uh, and some of these are um, likely to be with us for, for um, the next at least year ahead. Um, with the focus on the retail sector and some of those um, uh, parliamentary and government mechanisms that we've we've got coming up, um, the the Food and Grocery Code of Conduct review uh, and the Senate inquiry into supermarkets, I think those provide a really good opportunity for us to hopefully um, uh, eke out some further protections for growers that supply the retail channel. Um, there's some fairly obvious uh, policy changes that we might be seeking through uh, through those two um, inquiries in particular making the Food and Grocery Code mandatory, uh, having a genuinely independent arbitration process that uh, suppliers actually feel that they can use without the genuine fear of commercial retribution that exists. Um, but we also need to ensure that there's no unintended consequences from these two mechanisms that lead us down a path that uh, has some unintended consequences and doesn't uh, adequately address the power imbalance that exists for uh, for growers that supply the retail channel. So. Whilst 2023 has been has been challenging, um, you know, prices have been have been depressed. The margin squeeze is real for a lot of businesses uh, in terms of you know viability of their ongoing production. Um, but uh, I think you know as we move into the, into the new year, there is some hope that uh, we can hopefully um, you know address this power imbalance and and uh, get uh, growers receiving a, a viable and sustainable price for their produce. Because we really don't want to see, you know, growers exiting the sector. It's a, such an important sector for for the Australian economy. It's important for feeding our nation as well as the international markets, uh, and it's important that we, you know, retain a, cap- a sovereign capability in this country of uh, food producing farmers. Something to look forward to for next year. Thank you very much, Michael. Thanks, Tom. You're listening to the VegLog podcast, brought to you by AusVeg. In late November, South Australian onion growers got together in Murray Bridge for a networking lunch to hear presentations from a number of leading researchers. Growers heard from US researcher Lindsay Dutoit, who spoke about her project Stop the Rot, and how her research and experience in American and South African onion production systems 
can be applied to the South Australian onion industry. Growers also got hands-on with herbicide pot trials displaying the efficacy of herbicides on ryegrass, presented by Dr Sam Kleeman of Plant Science Consulting. The event was coordinated by Ausveg's Engagement and Extension Support Officer, Grace Winkler. In late November 2023, some 30 onion growers, agronomists and industry members met in Murray Bridge for an industry lunch. This event included presentations from US researcher Lindsay DeToit and Dr Sam Kleeman and Dr Peter Putsalas from Plant Science Consulting. The event was designed to bring together the expertise of researchers and the on-farm and industry knowledge of growers and agronomists to allow discussion of the practical implications of the new research. Lindsay has 23 years of experience in plant pathology and is a professor at Washington State University, most recently being appointed as chair of WSU's Department of Plant Pathology. Australian growers had an opportunity to learn about her research earlier this year during the 10th International Spinach Conference held in Melbourne, and more recently during the Australasian Plant Pathology Conference in Adelaide. Stop the Rot is Lindsay's current project, which brings together scientists from diverse disciplines across the US to research bacterial diseases in onions. The aim is to develop practical, economically sound strategies for pathogen detection and management to improve onion production. The US onion production is significant, with 10,000 hectares of storage onion production, most of which is direct seeded in semi-arid regions. Most crops are irrigated with centre pivots or drip irrigation, and fumigants are common prior to planting. Backed by the USDA Specialty Crops Research Initiative, Lindsay said that it will run for four years to characterise onion bacterial disease and to develop a management plan that can be applied on farm. This is funded by the USDA um, Specialty Crops Research Initiative. It's a very large project with uh, 11 states in the US and one other country involved. And it's a $4 million project um, spread over four years and really, really fairly comprehensive, which is the intention of the Specialty Crops Research Initiative. The reason we're doing this project is these bacteria are everywhere. You can't escape them. Um, you can't spray against them. We don't have any systemic cure calorie effective bactericides. Um, there's a lot of misinformation we don't know about who's doing what because you can get all kinds of bacteria out of onions and we don't have really good rapid detection methods to know what bacteria are there, which ones are pathogenic, which ones are along for the way. Um, and there's not good resistance in commercial cultivars, particularly if you're using other head irrigation. As expected, the bacteria and the ideal conditions for bacterial disease differ in different climates and production systems. One of the findings to arise from the research is that copper resistance genes are common in onion isolates of the bacteria Pantoa. A study of grower production systems revealed that many apply copper on a range of crops, including potatoes, carrots, peas and beans, so it was not surprising to Lindsay's team that a tolerance has been established. To investigate bacterial bulb rot, the team have done everything possible, including the inoculation of bacteria to create an environment for disease development, flying in the face of what good growing conditions should be like for marketable yields. Irrigation, in terms of frequency, timing, drip versus pivot, and the amount of water, were done in the worst possible way. When nearing harvest, the bulbs were studied for marketable yield. Results showed that management of irrigation was a factor in bulb rot. The other surprise was the height of cutting the neck and the methodology used. In Georgia, the youngins are harvested top green. The use of thermofogging is quite common for commercial onion growers in the US, so the team has assessed the use of disinfectants post-harvest in storage. In the trials conducted, it was not clear if the disinfectants were actually effective in preventing bulb rot once in storage, but many growers had a preference to use the products for peace of mind. Finally, from an economic perspective, the Stop the Rot project aims to develop a program to assess the risk of bacterial diseases that will give growers a tool for decision making through the season based on factors such as environmental conditions, soil fertility and weed pressure that may mean harvest and market is a better option than storage. For more information on the Stop the Rot project, you can visit allymnet.com. From a local perspective, Dr Peter Botsalas and Dr Sam Kleeman gave the young and growers first-hand representation of the problems in the industry with ryegrass herbicide resistance with a pot trials demonstration. The young industry is limited in the number of herbicides that can be used with any real efficacy. Peter and Sam's trials clearly showed the effect or lack of of different groups of herbicides such as Fusilade, Clethodim, Glyphosate, Paracot and Sakura. Observations within the broadacre sector suggest that there are opportunities for onion growers to apply different management techniques for cover crop application or the small window between the cereal cover crop, knockdown and planting of the onion crop. By changing how we approach ryegrass management, it is possible to get on top of the problem within a few years. It's highly competitive. 
Um, you guys are probably familiar that in onions, I've, I'm grasping that onions are a fairly poor competitor. Put it into context, a single ryegrass, multi-tilled ryegrass plant, the absence of decent competition can produce up to 3,000 seeds. In a worst case scenario where you've literally got a lawn mat, you can add 30 to 40,000 seeds produced in a single year. So huge seed production. Um, the upside with ryegrass, as opposed to many other troublesome weed species we deal with, it does generally have a relatively short-lived seed bait. So the seed bait of ryegrass, if you would prevent seed set um, over a duration of time, so it's fresh input, you can effectively run down the seed bait within the space of three years. So that's a massive, massive plus. Some weed species seed can persist persists for as long as eight years. So that basically means that if you put tactical management in place, uh, where you prevent fresh seed input, effectively you can run down the seed bakes to low manageable levels, i.e. before coming into onions within the space of three years. Lindsay, Peter and Sam stress that testing is the surest way to determine what bacteria is present or whether you have herbicide resistance. The benefit of events such as the onion lunch is that it's not just the growers who gain knowledge and have an opportunity to speak with their peers. Lindsay and Peter both agreed that the one-on-one -on -one conversations they have after in a social setting can be quite insightful and rewarding. Researchers gain greater insight into production systems at a local level, but in Lindsay's case, the similarities between the South Australian onion growers and the semi-arid growing regions of the US lend themselves to comparative analysis. In one such example, Peter was able to assist a grower with ryegrass occurring in small sections of the paddock when a simple conversation revealed a better way to harvest to reduce the issue. Well, I've, I've gained so much new information from just speaking to a few growers today. Um, one of them was back to this cultural um, area is that one of the growers said they, they harvested their, their field and where they were um, behind the header in every area, every certain um, distance, there was a lot of ryegrass in, right behind the harvester but not either side of the harvester, which meant that they were throwing a lot of weed seed back. Now we've got techniques, right. um, broadacre farmers use them where they, they capture that ryegrass that's coming, or the, the fine material coming from a harvester, and either they have a machine, extra machine, a mill, which destroys the seed, or they have a, like a big trailer, chaff cart, which captures it, and then you, you dump it, or you can sell it for stock feed. Yeah. So that is one way that this grower wouldn't have had any ryegrass back in this field. That's cultural. Yeah. They can adapt it very easily because their fields are much smaller than huge acreages. Mm -hmm. This project is funded by Horde Innovation using the onion levy and contributions from the Australian government under project code VN21000. While the horticulture industry has historically been male dominated, the number of women in the sector is continuing to grow. With more young women entering the industry or considering a career in horticulture, the role of female mentors is perhaps more important than ever. Women like Angela Candeloro of Tripod Farmers in Victoria are sending the ladder back down, as they say, to help young people in the industry get a leg up. Angela was recognised for her contribution to the industry earlier in 2023 when she was presented with the Boomeroo Nurseries Women in Horticulture Award at Hort Connections 2023. Osveg's Deborah Hill spoke with Angela about her life growing up on the family farm and her journey as an industry mentor. My name is Deborah Hill. Today we're having a chat with Angela Candeloro, the director of Tripod Farmers Group here at Bacchus Marsh, to have a chat about what happens here at Tripod Farmers Group and also Angela is the most recent recipient of the Women in Hort Award for the Horticulture Excellence Awards uh, announced in Adelaide in 2023. So welcome, Angela. Thank you, Deborah. Tell us a little bit about the history of Tripod Farmers Group. Tripod Farmers um, Group started in 1989 and it was really a continuation of my family business. So my family uh, Italian immigrants, my, both my um, parents and uh, my grandfather on my mother's side, he was a market gardener in Werribee um, back in, you know, in the mid 50s. Um, my parents moved to Bacchus Marsh in uh, 1960 and they started farming here after buying their own little block. Yeah. And 
we, I virtually lived with them, you know, for all of my, up until I was about 19. Um, and we worked on the family farm as well. Um, and that started at a very young age. Yeah, so clearly you've been on farm pretty well all your life. What was it like for a, a young Italian immigrant family girl growing up on a, on, a, on a farm? Yeah, I mean, it was tough. It had lots of great family aspect to it, but the actual lifestyle was a hard lifestyle because we weren't spoilt in any way and there was a huge expectation on Carmel, my sister and myself, at a very young age. We have no brothers, and so we were the everything as far as help. Um, so I suppose my parents, um, they did, my, my mother, she did every task on the farm, um, and my father had that same expectation that we would, we could. He, there was never any doubt that we could do whatever was required, right. and I think, that that's been a really helpful, um, you know, uh, upbringing to have. You know, I clearly remember times like where my dad would say, oh, come and help me, you know, hook this implement up to the back of a tractor. And this implement was really heavy and we didn't have the modern hitches that we have nowadays. Yeah. And it, the implement sort of had a bar that had to be hooked up to another bar that was on the tractor. And, and he'd say to me, oh, lift that. So I'd try and lift it and I'd think, well, wow, that didn't go far. <laughs> but he never, ever expressed that I couldn't do it or that, you know, you're not going to be able to do that. He always like, yep, just lift it, lift it so he could pin it. And, I'm, and at the time, I remember being angry with him, like, you know, sort of thinking, How? I can't lift that. But he, it, it helped me to persevere and push through and, yeah. and do it. So... Um, yeah, that, they're the sorts of things, you know, we didn't have family holidays because, you know, summers were our busy times and all my friends here would, you know, go on holidays and we were always, well, farming. always farming. And that is part of farming life, Absolutely. isn't it? That, you know, when it's time to harvest, it's yes. time to harvest. Yep, that's yeah. right. Do you think your father, that philosophy that just get in there and do it, has that helped you right throughout your life in, in then taking over the business yourself? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, without that, um, you know, that made us stronger and it made us have that courage and that resilience to keep trying. Yeah. Um, and I think that's very helpful. Have there been times then when there has been a challenge and you've thought, how the hell am I going to get through this and then draw on that strength that your family values have given you? Absolutely. I never realised it at the time, just like I didn't realise when I was growing up that, you know, oh, you know, I've got it tough. Uh, well, I thought that I had it tough and was resenting that. Um, but now I'm super grateful. And when I look back on my life, I sort of, I see now, wow, you know, I, I don't think that I could have done that if I hadn't lived the life that I'd lived and definitely very helpful. So with younger people coming through into farming and needing that support, that, that encouragement, that mentor, how do you feel about your background in terms of being able to help them come through and give them the support that they need and that, that you would have had from your family? Yes. I think it's come easily because of that example that I was given by my parents um, and in particular my dad. And I suppose saying that you know, why do I say that? And I actually don't really know, but it just seemed to come, you know, coming from a male, I was probably more resentful of that and going back before the days of equality and yes. all the rest of it that we hear about today, because we didn't hear about that back then. Um, but yeah, there was just something that made me take more notice and it made it more important that I do succeed in whatever task was given. And as far as mentoring people that come through, um, I suppose I've done every job that these people are doing today, or most, most of them anyway. And it's really helped me to understand, um, and I don't forget the very first times that I did those tasks and how difficult I found it at the start, um, and that it does get easier. And yeah, the people that help us are, you know, just amazing that we, we that they're willing to do what they do do. Um, without them, you know, we wouldn't be here. So there are a lot of people in the industry who do regard you as a wonderful mentor, 
um, is certainly a fine example of women in horticulture. How do you feel about that? Well, thank you. Um, um, I'm really humbled and honoured to for people to have um, expressed that. Um, I think it's a great privilege to be able to um, mentor younger people, especially the women that come through, because quite often the staff that come through are from um, backgrounds that perhaps um, women aren't empowered and the fact that they can come to work and be given a team leader role or whatever role, I think that um, they find they're very appreciative of that and I think that that helps them to gain confidence and grow and you know I think Australia is fabulous that it's been able to um, offer that opportunity to so many people. Yeah. yeah. So then you were the recipient this year of the Women in Horticulture Award sponsored by Boomeroo Nurseries. Receiving that award, how did you feel? I couldn't believe it. I still can't believe it. <laughs> I, I absolutely still can't believe it. You know, honoured that that award was given to me, but then again, also grateful that, and that award isn't about me. That award is really nothing to do with me because yeah. I think, you know, my sister Carmel, who's the other director in our business, um, my sons and my nephew that work in the business as well, all of the people that you've seen as we've walked around, that's really for them because that's, it's because of them that that yeah. award was given because I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for them. Yeah. So I'm really grateful. Um, grateful to Boomeroo for sponsoring the award, grateful to Ausveg for the effort they go to in, in making it all happen. But, you know, incredibly grateful to all of those people that yeah. support me every single day. For those next generations that are coming through, what advice would you give to them to succeed and, and become mentors themselves in the industry? I think it's really important that you love what you do and that you're really passionate. And horticulture is, I feel, is a great industry to be in because what we do, we're offering really good, healthy food yeah. to, to people. Um, so there's that good feeling about we're doing something that's great for the population. Yeah. Um, and we really are a, a very important part of the food chain. If somebody is coming into the industry I think if they've got the passion they can do anything and if they work hard at it um, and it doesn't matter if you're a girl or a guy um, they they can do it and I see it every single day so um, yeah it's really important that they just stay focused and, and are prepared to work hard. Thank you, Angela, for uh, your time today and showing us around uh, Tripod Farmers Group. It's been an absolute joy to meet you, learn more about you and see what you are providing, both in, in terms of food security and, and employment for the young people. So thank you for today and uh, your time with us to have a chat about your award. Congratulations. Thank you, Deborah. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. Thanks for listening to the Vegalog podcast. Don't forget to subscribe and give the podcast a rating and review to help others find us. Vegalog is produced by Ausveg, the peak industry body for Australian vegetable growers. You can find more news and information from Ausveg at ausveg.com.au, on our social media channels, or in Australian Grower Magazine. See you next time.